Are you suffering from Liz Truss whiplash? She arrived, quickly vanished, but has popped up again in quite an interesting place. Thank you so much. And it's fantastic to be here at CPAC with so many true Conservatives. Like Nigel Farage before her, she's found a keen audience amongst the MAGA right deep in Trump land. I gotta tell you, I really feel for, uh, I really feel for the United Kingdom. I mean, you guys... We are gonna save it, Steve. I'm okay. not a pessimist like okay. you, I'm an optimist. Okay. I know it can okay. be saved. She also has a book out, of course. And out of the ashes of her short premiership, a new political group to champion her view of the world. It's difficult being a Conservative at the moment. It's difficult advocating these causes. And it's why we need a popular Conservative movement to actually challenge from below what is happening in our country. What should we make of this? What do her former colleagues make of it? Her former colleagues in the cabinet don't really know whether to be angry or amused. So one senior minister said to me recently, she's drunk the Kool-Aid and started to believe her own propaganda. You're listening to Stories of Our Times, from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Luke Jones. Today, what Liz Truss did next. I'm Rachel Sylvester, and I'm a columnist at The Times. You've met Liz Truss before. I have, and I've interviewed her over the years. And in fact, she's the only person I've ever interviewed, the only cabinet minister who asked for a selfie at the end of the interview. Did you oblige? (laughs) Of course. And she then put it on Instagram and sort of said, what could possibly go wrong, an interview with The Times. Not met you before then, clearly. (laughs) (laughs) She has absolutely no self-doubt. Just a few weeks after she left number 10 in disgrace, most people would feel, I bumped into one of her aides at the time who said she's the only woman in politics who's got absolutely no imposter syndrome whatsoever. And in Mm. fact, she could probably do with a bit more of it. And this was from one of her advisors. So there is an extraordinary lack of self-awareness. On a positive side, there's a huge energy and enthusiasm and refusal to stop. Isn't that just what politicians are like, though? She's got it more severely and more extremely, I think, than most. I think most politicians, having been through what she went through with that mini budget, effectively crashed the economy, sent mortgage rates soaring, been bundled out of Downing Street, would have snuck away with their tail between their legs for a bit. She's used to raising eyebrows across her career. I mean, I'm thinking even of that speech where she talked about pork markets and cheese being imported. But very recently, when she's popped up in the US, she raised eyebrows in conversation with Steve Bannon, a former Trump aide, of course. If that answer is to save my country, this country will be saved. War Room. Here's your host, Stephen K. Bannon. What did you make of that exchange? Well, what's fascinating, I think, is that she's desperately trying to blame everyone else for her own mistakes. Was it The Economist that got you? Was it the Financial Times of London? Are these the people we got? This is the party at the the city of London. Are they the ones that run the deal over there? these, These are the friends of the bureaucratic establishment. They are the friends of the deep state. So it's got to be the deep state. It's got to be some sort of sinister left-wing cabal who thwarted her plan. So she blamed everyone from The Economist, The Financial Times, the OBR, the Bank of England, the IMF, anyone except herself for the economic impact of her policies. I spoke to one senior MP, Conservative MP, who said the markets aren't a liberal left-wing conspiracy. They're not the deep state. They just do what they do. It's like the weather. You can't Mm. sort of criticise them for reacting to your policies. It's become increasingly fantastical conspiracy theories, I think because, I think she probably believes it, And she can't actually accept the consequences of her own actions. So she's trying to justify what happened and trying to justify to herself what happened. Mm. I think it's about psychology as much as about politics, actually. And I'm very interested in whether 
this is a change we've seen in her, as you're suggesting, or whether it's her presenting the same thing slightly differently. So if we rewind in her career to when she was on one of those debate stages opposite Rishi Sunak, they were battling it out to become the next leader of the Conservative Party. Rishi, I don't believe this negative, declinist language It's your own economic hearing. advisor, Liz. It's we, not mine. We, it's your own advisor. I have lots of economists that are backing my plans. Minus all of this language about the deep state and the administrative state and blaming the economists and others, she was talking about the same thing, wasn't she? The sort of same platform was there, albeit without the colourful language. No, I think she's changed quite dramatically, actually. So she's always been a libertarian, free marketeer, an arch-liberal. Mm. But now she's talking about what she calls wokeonomics. She's kind of getting engaged in the culture war in a way that she never would have done, I don't think, in the past. People want control of their own lives. They don't want the government telling them what to do. They don't want these woke policies inflicted on them. But the problem is the leftist activists have been very, very assiduous at pushing that agenda. So I spoke to one of her aides who worked with her in Downing Street who just said, you know, she's unrecognisable to the person that we all worked with when they were in government with her. And I spoke to Amber Rudd as well, the former Home Secretary, who Mm. sat around the cabinet table with her. And she said that she thought that the Liz Truss of 2010 just wouldn't recognise the Liz Truss of 2024 Mm. because she'd changed so much. And I think what's interesting is what that says about the Conservative Party, that she feels the way to have influence in the Tory party now is to play into that culture war that some right-wingers are Mm. engaging in. And that's her entry point. And that the sort of classic, more Thatcherite, free marketeer, libertarian liberalism isn't enough anymore in the Conservative Party. If we're to continue with our armchair psychology and delve into that catastrophic event which might have brought about this change in her, her, her premiership and the way it fell apart, take us back to the start of it and whether it was always a chronicle of a death foretold, do you think, at that time? Well, if you remember, there was the leadership contest where she beat Rishi Sunak and the Conservative Party members went for the most right-wing candidate. Now is the time to do different and to be different. And I have that plan. So at one level, it was clear the direction she was going to go. And then with Kwasi Kwarteng, she very quickly, even before getting to Downing Street, they'd planned this very dramatic Mm. first budget. But I think nobody really expected it to be as expansive and enormous as it was. I'm not going to cut the additional rate of tax today, Mr Speaker. I'm going to abolish it altogether. From April the 23rd, have a a single higher rate of income tax of 40%. She didn't just make one change, she chucked everything at it. And then they doubled down, saying they would want it to go further, if anything. And the markets just panicked. It was these unfunded tax cuts that seemed incredibly risky at a time when the economy was already looking quite shaky. Mm. And I think she's always been a risk taker. She's never been one to sort of compromise. She doesn't mind making enemies and annoying people and, you know, ruffling feathers. And this was just taking that to its logical conclusion. But now that ideology was running up against the reality, the harsh reality Mm. of the international financial markets. And the whole thing exploded. Dominica Connell, our business correspondent, is here. You're here a bit early, Dom. The news is so bad. Uh, What's going on? Uh, Well, the pound fell to $1.03 in Asian markets overnight. Quite small volumes of trading, but that is the lowest it has been certainly since March 1985. And at the time, can you remember being surprised by that. Yeah, I think she just decided when she got into Downing Street, she was going to go for it and double down. So she now has this argument that she was thwarted and she wasn't able to properly do what she wanted. But I spoke to one person who worked very closely with her in Downing Street, who said, it's just not true. She knows that's bollocks, he said, because in fact, she didn't consult the civil service. She and Kwasi Kwarteng removed the permanent secretary at the Treasury. You know, she didn't send the information to the OBR in advance. So 
she was very isolated. She took these decisions on her own. That means it's her responsibility and Quasi Kwarteng's responsibility. But now she's sort of trying to blame everyone else. And I think, you know, back to the psychology, when it's all on her head, she can't really accept that. Now, some people say we were in too much of a rush. And it's certainly true that I didn't just try to fatten the pig on market day. I tried to rear the pig, fatten the pig and slaughter the pig on market day. I confess to that. I remember going to that Conservative Party conference in 2022, the autumn of 2022, Mm. and I'd never known Tory MPs so furious and bewildered and confused. The whole thing was unravelling incredibly quickly. And then, of course, within weeks, she was out. And in that situation, for someone like you, how does that present itself? Is it just angry red faces coming up to you and just letting off steam? Yes, and I mean, just a sense of bafflement and fury that, you know, the Conservatives had always prided themselves and been trusted by the voters as being competent on the economy. And there she was. She'd blown that up. Mm. And there was just a sense of absolute despair. Yeah. And there was a period after she came out of office where she sort of vanished from view. And I mean, you can only imagine what was going on ahead at that time. I think in the past, Ed Miliband has said after he lost an election, he ended up seeing therapy, such was the the weight of that, having a country re- reject you. Do we know what the immediate fallout for her was in her own political world in Westminster with those allies? What's rather fascinating, I've been looking at her register of members' interests in the House of Commons mm. for 2023, so the year pretty quickly after she was ousted, actually. And already she was on the international lecture circuit, making quite a lot of money in Tokyo, Taiwan, Mumbai, Switzerland, going around giving these lectures on... What kind of money? Well, it was about £300,000 over the course of the year, both wow. abroad and in in the UK. So compared to Boris Johnson, that's probably peanuts. But, I mean, a, a fair whack for yeah. any normal, disgraced former prime minister. And these are what? Speeches? Taking part in panels? I mean, so it's speeches, panels, conferences... So in February, she got 65,000 for a speaking engagement in Mumbai, 6,000 for a speech in Tokyo, 80,000 for a four-hour event in Taiwan. In June, it was 32,000 for a speaking in Switzerland. In July, 32,000 for participating in a discussion in Dublin. So she's got a sort of market for mm. these kind of purist ideological ideas. And I think she's realising particularly in America. Sort of like a stand-up on tour, I guess, sort of honing an act. (laughs) Well, I think that's right. And she seems to have sort of got slightly more and more extreme in this conspiracy theory, deep state Mm. argument, which actually, even for some of her supporters who were at the kind of launch of PopCon, Popular Conservatives, her think tank in the UK, were really uncomfortable with that. that. And that was the moment where it actually really landed on the agenda here, wasn't it? What she was turning into and what she was talking about. Okay, she might be saying these things around the world, but PopCon was where it landed in the UK. Just explain what that was. It was sort of a day-long jamboree for sort of right-wing types. Yes, exactly. So popular conservatism, which even some Tory MPs say at the moment is a slight contradiction in terms, given the state of the polls, particularly for Liz Truss, whose own personal approval rating is minus 60%. Okay. (laughs) So not exactly popular conservatism. And the other thing that's quite funny, MPs have noticed that on iPhone, PopCon autocorrects to popcorn, which, you know, is slightly appropriate when you think of the horror movie yeah. the Tory party is turning into at the moment, not aided and abetted by Liz Truss and her friends. If all of us are being honest in this room, we've been swimming against the tide when we're talking about conservative values. Whether it's what's going on in our schools and the fact that wokeism seems to be on the curriculum. But this was a kind of jamboree for right-wing Tories trying to set an agenda, push Rishi Sunak in a particular direction, but also, I think, lay the ground for an ideological battle after the general Mm. election. Names including 
So it was Jacob Rees-Mogg, Lee Anderson, Pretty Patel, David Frost, and interestingly, Nigel Farage. I'm here because I'm interested in ideas. You know, they can try as hard as they like to change the Conservative Party. I don't think they're going to succeed. So the question a lot of Conservative MPs are asking is, will this become a vehicle for kind of uniting that reform Brexit party wing of the Mm. electorate with the mainstream Tory party as a kind of force of the right? Would you (laughs) think of working with Nigel on maybe restructuring the Tory party? I will work with whoever it takes to make our country successful. I will work with whoever. And Nigel... I would like him to become a member of the Conservative Party and wow. help turn our country wow. around. I spoke to Jacob Rees-Mogg recently, who said that he admired both Liz Truss and Theresa May because he thinks that it's a good thing if former prime ministers continue to contribute to mm. public life and that he thinks the ideas that Liz Truss is generating are good. But... Really interestingly, he doesn't agree with her on this idea of the deep state because he said he doesn't think there are any conspiracies because the British state isn't clever enough. (laughs) (laughs) And it's all far too chaotic and leaky for there to be some great panjandrum running everything. So actually, even he, who is probably one of her closest supporters, is sceptical about this. KB News presenter. Yeah, but he's sceptical about this more American-style approach. So I think she needs to be a bit careful not to alienate even her own supporters, actually. And if Liz Truss wants to go international with this, and I'm thinking particularly about the US, Nigel Farage actually is quite an interesting example for her to follow. Yes, he's been, you know, welcomed with open arms at Trumpian events like CPAC recently. He's close to those alt-right Republicans like Steve Bannon. And I think she can see that there's a market for her ideas and her books. Rachel, you've been taking us on a tour through Liz Trussland from her short premiership to what happened afterwards, her scooping up cash around the world at speaking events. And then when she landed back in the UK with this pop con conference and having quite a shift in terms of her ideology and how she was presenting it. And we were just getting to the US where she's particularly made a splash with this at CPAC, the... Conservative Political Action conference. Yes. Which and that's is, sort of popcorn plus. Yeah. It's bigger, kind as of everything is in the US. Trump land, trust land, Trump land, shindig hmm. uh, in Maryland at, at the end of February. And she went over there and did a speech on the main stage to a actually half empty hall of Trump supporters in kind of make America great again regalia. Thank you so much. And it's fantastic to be here at CPAC with so many true conservatives. And boy, are you needed now. She rehearsed these arguments about the deep state, the sort of liberal conspiracy. The reality is that the West has been run by the left for too long. And we've seen that it's been a complete disaster. She talked about how there were conservatives who were what she called chinos. Chinos. Conservatives in name only. I think in America you call them rhinos. Uh, Republicans in name only. But it's the same tendency. Somehow this sense that conservatives were being diluted by these wicked left-wing ideas, like what she called wokeonomics. We've got a new kind of economics now in the West. It's called wokeonomics. It's actually about DEI and ESG and all those other three-letter acronyms that mean less opportunities for people and less future for our nation. That somehow the terms of reference for politics were being set by the left, which is rather fascinating when actually the Conservatives in the UK have been in power for 14 years, including herself as prime minister for part of that and herself as a cabinet minister for most of that time. So it's a, it's a kind of, again, it's a buck-passing operation. If there really are these appalling left-wing ideologies taking hold, then why hasn't the Conservative government dealt with them? Mm. I think her former 
colleagues in the cabinet don't really know whether to be angry or amused. So one senior minister said to me recently, she's drunk the Kool-Aid and started to believe her own propaganda, which is always incredibly unwise. For her to crash the economy, destroy the Tory party's reputation for economic competence, be expelled from office, and then to express neither contrition nor self-doubt is frankly weird. I can see how this train of thought is is quite seductive to American voters. It clearly has been with the election in the past of Donald Trump as president. But how do you think that kind of thing plays here? Politicians complaining about the deep state, talking about economics. Do you think there is a large enough constituency who are concerned about that kind of thing? No, I don't. I think there are some people at Westminster who are obsessed by American politics and mm. think that there are lessons left, right and centre for British politics from Washington. But actually, I think Britain is very different to America, particularly on these questions of culture war. I think British voters don't like a sense of nastiness. They don't like personal attacks in the same way as you see Donald Trump doing the whole time. You just have to look at how unpopular Trump is in Britain. And when Liz Truss was, was at this Conservative conference in the US, that there was an interesting moment where, where someone at, at one of the discussions she was at, actually it was Steve Bannon, wasn't it, mm. raised Tommy Robinson and referred to him as a hero and she kept stum. Hang on, I don't understand this. The grooming situation, Tommy Robinson, all these heroes fought it. So the people around her, I try and say that she didn't hear properly or didn't register properly what he said, but a lot of Conservative MPs were very disturbed by that. They thought that was a really dark moment that any politician, any MP should have immediately called that out and said he's certainly not a hero, this far-right, mm. dangerous character. But actually, even if she didn't, hear exactly what he said. What was she doing, doing an interview with Steve Bannon, this, a man who, you know, whipped up the Capitol rioters, who's this sort of alt-right provocateur, banned from Twitter for advocating beheadings. But I got to tell you, I really feel for, uh, I really feel for the United Kingdom. I mean, you guys... We are going to save it, Steve. I'm okay. not a pessimist like okay. you. I'm an optimist. Okay. I know it can okay. be saved. What's she doing in any case siding with somebody like that? So even people who are supportive of her politics and her ideas in general mm. were really uncomfortable with going that far with that kind of American culture war style of politics. How much is she then a liability for Rishi Sunak if he's trying to position himself as, as not that? Well, it was really interesting during the budget. Labour MPs just kept shouting, where's Liz, where's Liz? ...high as we bring down inflation. But because of the progress we've made... Because we are so for Labour, this is an absolute open goal. Liz Truss crashed the economy. The Conservatives are definitely paying the price in terms of their reputation for economic competence. Mm. And Rishi Sunak must know to some extent that she's a liability. But he also knows, and this is the problem for him, that she represents a sort of part of the Tory party that he daren't completely alienate. It's the mm. same with Suela Braverman and these kind of right-wingers who are slightly holding him to ransom. But he, he seems unable to choose between the two bits of his party and perhaps himself. Yes. And how how big a gulf, if any, do you think there is between that end of the Conservative Party, which you've got Liz Truss as a sort of figurehead of, and then Nigel Farage over the Rubicon at reform? I mean, can you get a sort of cigarette paper between the two of them, would you say? Well, I think there is more that the popcorn bit of the Tory party and Nigel Farage have in common, mm. perhaps, than the popcorn bit of the Tory party have in common with the moderate Conservatives. Yes. I mean, if you think of someone like Ken Clark mm. or even perhaps Jeremy Hunt, mm. who are much more centrist, more moderate, they would have very little in common with Nigel Farage. They would be deeply uncomfortable with this kind of culture war approach to politics. At one level... Liz Truss is irrelevant and her denials of reality are quite amusing. But on the other hand, I think it's quite important because it's about where the Conservative Party goes after the general election. And 
I spoke to someone recently, a senior Tory, who said, look, there's a battle for the soul of the Tory party going on already, and it's going to get even more profound after the general election if the Tories lose. And you see this as being about the Conservative Party. This isn't a question of whether Liz Truss et al. decamp to reform and join with Farage and make that their new home. It's more about trying to bring that kind of thinking and that kind of voter who's interested in that back over to the Conservatives. Yeah, I think it's more about where the Tories go after the election. Mm. Do they try and retain a broad base or do they try and align with a more Farageist Tory party? And another strategist said to me, you know, this is all about the Farage Farageization of the Conservative Party. And this person predicted that Farage could even be the next Tory leader but one. But one, interesting. Oh, so as in Rishi Sunak would lose the general election, you'd have someone Somebody who'd take over, in... who'd welcome Farage back into the fold, and then he'd rise to the And top. as this person said to me, Farage is nobody's deputy. <laughs> well, yeah, quite, as I'm <laughs> sure Richard Dice is finding out at the moment. Yeah. Speaking of elections, do we know what Liz Truss's plan is? I mean, I assume she's standing again. I don't think she's explicitly said, but I assume mm. so. The interesting thing is what she sees her role as yeah. after that election. So... I mean, maybe in her heart of hearts, she thinks she could still have a tilt at the leadership, but I don't think anyone around her, even even her most avid supporters, would think that. But I think she certainly feels that she could be a king or queen maker in a future Tory leadership contest and be the sort of influential figure delivering a section of the electorate and also influencing the direction of the party. This is all very fascinating and interesting and speaks to our our wider politics and the future of this country. This is also one long book plug as well for Liz Truss. She's got a book out. (laughs) Yes. She's got this book out in April, which is cool, with incredible chutzpah, 10 years to save the West. And what I find interesting is there are different subtitles on different sides of the Atlantic. So in the UK, she offers readers lessons from the only conservative in the room. But in the US, the strapline promises that she's leading the revolution against globalism, socialism, and the liberal establishment, which is quite a turnaround for somebody who's always been a sort of free marketeer promoting international trade. She's now somehow against globalism. Will you be reading, Rachel? <laughs> well, I think it could be gripping or perhaps not. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Luke Jones, and my guest, Times columnist Rachel Sylvester. If you'd like to relive Liz Truss's 40-odd days in power, we had a look back on the anniversary of her arrival in Number 10. If you fancy that nostalgia trip, we've put a link in the description. The producer today was Edward Drummond, the executive producer was Fiona Leach, and sound design was by Mao Lissetto. If you can, leave us a review. It helps other people find us. You can also email storiesofourtimes at thetimes.co.uk. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>